Uh, once again, on behalf of Tipperary Development, I'm delighted to um, invite you all here again this evening for our third coaching um, webinar. Um, our, um, our speaker this evening is uh, Dinny Ferncombe. Dinny is the current coach to the Tipperary Senior Camogie team, and he's been involved with that Camogie, with the Camogie team senior since 2019. Um, he has previously coached at Mary Macklin College um, and was involved in their Fitzgibbon Cup teams, winning uh, teams in 2016 and 17. Um, Dinny's from Holy Cross, uh, Ballycal, and he is the current uh, goalkeeper for their senior team. And he's held many coaching roles within his club at juvenile and at adult levels. So you're very welcome, Ginny. Thanks, Melian. And again, I'm delighted to have back our two panellists uh, this week. Um, the first of them is Brian Boyle. Brian, again, is no stranger to, to Prairie Camogie. Um, he was previous um, uh, manager for the senior and intermediate teams. Um, he's a uh, master's and he specialises in FMS. Um, he's a GA and Camogie tutor. Um, he's the current Camogie coach in Mary Macla College for the season 21 22. And he was the minor um, hurling uh, goalkeeping coach in 2020. And by day, he's a primary school principal. And uh, as, I, as I say every week, um, Camogie and hurling are always on the timetable. And our second panelist for this evening is um, Barry Milan. Um, Barry was a games development officer in Dublin for many years. Uh, and in the last couple of years, he relocated to his native uh, Ballybaton Grange. Uh, Barry has a, a master's uh, in sports coaching. Uh, he's the founder of Active Sports. Uh, he's the hurling coach for Dearly Sports Science. And uh, he's currently coaching uh, our Finnan senior football team. So I'm delighted to have our two panellists, uh, Brian and Barry. So you're very welcome and thank you. Uh, Dinny, we'll hand over to you now um, for the presentation and thanks a million. Thanks very much, Gronia. Um I'm just going to get this um, presentation shared to you there to start with and get going then. Mm-hmm. Okay, so look, yeah. hopefully hopefully that's all yeah. um get my phone clear there for everyone at the minute. Um like as I said already, good evening to everyone. It's kind of an evening where it would have been hard to maybe log in for some of us. We'd have been we'd we'd much prefer to be outside and uh playing some sports perhaps. Um and for all of us it would be much better to be out and giving this presentation in the field together. But I suppose even with today's news, we've had uh, light at the end of what has been a long tunnel so far in terms of getting back to the field. And it's great to see that we do have that, that date in mind now when we can return to the field. Okay, so just with tonight's uh, presentation, we're looking at games-based coaching for developing the teenage player. All right. Throughout the presentation, all right, I have a couple of facts there from research studies that I've went across in relation to... Uh, the retention of players and game-based um, coaching. Right, we look at the coaching philosophy, the environment to help player development, planning and preparation, and we link in these with player retention as well. And how what we do as coaches will probably help um, hold on to more players down the line. Uh, and I suppose the big area that we're going to be looking at tonight is examining the basic skills in games and the game-based approach. Right, so we'll be looking at how we can practice our skills in a game-based environment rather than just a singular linear, single linear um, drill function, right? Putting the players into the game's environment to help them make decisions is what we're kind of looking at, right? And then we'll also go through some game plays for team development, right? So we'll explain this later on in the presentation. And of course, at any stage, uh, questions, just get them into the Q&A or the chat box and Barry and Brian will look after them and between us we'll get through questions at the end of the presentation. Um, okay, so first area with some of the research that I've uh, went back through over time in terms of preparing for my own coaching. So these were got from coachingthecoaches.net and a survey through the GA with the University of Stirling. So emotional support and perceived efficiency in hurling involvement 
Our area's coaches can assist for prolonged athlete involvement, retention and engagement. This could include, include ideas such as cultivating personal involvement with players, offering two-way communication, utilising player input and understanding players' feelings. And the second one from this area, six key values, positive feedback, respect, belonging, empowerment, enjoyment, effort, which if, if expressed in a games environment would create the type of participation experience which would positively impact a young player's desire to play to stay. Uh, so this area, we're just looking at things that we can do as coaches within the environment or from our management teams, what we can do and what players are possibly, possibly looking for so that they would feel more comfortable and they would be in an environment that they'd like to stay in going forward. Uh, also with the FMS, research shows that if you're proficient in FMS, if you're confident because of that, then you're more likely to stay with physical activity. What we're finding now is that only 2.26% of those that were surveyed here were mastering the seven skills they tested for. Okay, so this survey was took, took place through the Gaelic for Girls program, which was uh, completed by Orla Farmer. And one of the things she noted from it was, in terms of motivators, research shows boys are motiv motivated more by competitiveness where girls tend to focus on the fun and social aspects. Uh, and barriers to enjoyment and involvement included lack of fun at sessions, that sessions were too long or coaches were too strict. Fun is the motivator and lack of enjoyment a barrier. Uh, so the big thing that we're taking from anything that we've looked at there is that they want fun in their sessions. They want enjoyment, right? They don't want to be, I suppose, controlled and... Um, they want that little bit of creativity themselves that they can just maybe explore different avenues within sessions, right? And the big thing is, if they're more confident, they will become um, better athlete, athletes and they're more likely to stay with physical activity as a result of being proficient in FMS. And the last area with the research then is to do with the game-based approaches. So these have been advocated as a pedagogy to improve decision-making, skill execution and physical fitness in physical education, teaching and sports, so, and sports coaching. Uh, so this information here is coming through from uh, Kinorka Tal 2018. Uh, so for many of us, we would be aware of Paul Kinork and his uh, experience as coaching with Clare and Limerick in more recent years. So um, research into coaching practice within game-focused sports commonly reports that coaches employ a traditional approach. Okay, so this tra traditional approach is drills, 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 and it's waiting in lines. It's uh, small contact with ball. It's waiting for the ball. Right? Traditional coaching approaches assume that technique needs to be mastered before gameplay. These approaches focus on the practice of technical skills, often in overly simplistic and unpressurized situations that do not mimic the demands of real gameplay. And this direct approach can create a separation between technique and tactical knowledge, leading to a disconnect between practice and gameplay where players are not able to respond to game situations. Uh, so just on that area there quickly, um, I, I suppose as coaches and in my earlier years of coaching as well, how many of us play the game on the sideline for the players? We constantly tell them what to do because we've told them what to do, drill after drill. Uh, we've told them to drop the hurley. We've told them to catch the ball. We've told them, told them exactly what to do. So it's what we're ending up doing is we're creating players that are waiting for that call from the sideline for them to move. Uh, we're creating reactive players to statements that we've made rather than creating those proactive players by helping them uh, make those decisions themselves within training, that's creating an environment where they can then uh, make those decisions in games because they're used to doing so. So with a coaching philosophy, all right, and we'll revisit this slide at the end and hopefully you may have um, added or changed some of the answers that you give to these questions. So as a coach, just yourself thinking, what are your core values? How will your approach, how will you approach your coaching role? What is your purpose and style? And how, how will you approach player development? 
And finally, define the term success to you. So these are all important questions that as a coach, you probably need to ask yourself these questions because in doing so, you'll get answers and you'll probably start developing and maybe heading towards different areas of coaching when you do get back to the field. So with that, I had a couple of ideas myself when I started out coaching and have developed them upon time as well. So for me, a warm, enjoyable environment that challenges players to want to develop and progress and not be afraid of making mistakes. To try and create a player-led environment. To challenge them to move out of their comfort zones. To break the development into smaller goals for the players. Rather than just having that one big goal of I want to win a championship, right? It's not about winning at these ages, right? That's why the word development is in there, right? We want to develop these players uh, and we want them to develop as people themselves as well. Uh, so maybe setting small goals and those goals could be individualized as well. Greet the players, chat with them, give effective feedback. Uh, nobody likes a coach that comes in, says nothing to a player and just uh, puts down cones Blows a whistle, let's get started. Right, be there before the training session. Greet the players as they're coming in. Maybe hand them out a slitter and get them to go pucking. Right, give them that little bit of time to just have a few pucks with their friends before you start a session. Right, success will vary for each of the girls you coach. Right, every girl that you coach, right, they're all coming into the situation with a different circumstance, with different ability. Right? You've got mixed ability in front of you. Success for one player uh, might not even come near success for another player. Right? One player might be success. Their success might be the ability to strike a ball cleanly off both sides. Right? Whereas another player might have a much larger success than that. Uh, and as you get on through the years, as you move up the grades, right? We're starting at fourteen here. As we're getting on to sixteen and eighteen. You want to get players to create non-negotiables as they move up the grades. Now, what I mean by non-negotiables is that this team and this panel, when they're together, that this is what they stand by. Right? One example that I always have in any team that I've been coaching with, a non-negotiable that I have is the attitude to work really hard for each other. Okay? If you've got that, you're going to get a long way. Right? Talent will come because you'll work on it. But if you can create an environment where your players will work really, really hard for each other, then that is a huge success. Then a quote. I never teach my students. I only provide the conditions which they can learn. Right? And it's, it's, very, it's very true to say that not a lot of coaching situations will follow this status. Right? I never teach my students. I only provide the conditions which they can learn. Right? We want that situation as coaches, as we develop on and learn more and more about coaching and learn more and more about our players. We want them to be able to learn within an environment that you have provided for them, but you haven't dictated for them. Right? If you dictate this stage for them, then they're going to be constantly looking for the answers off of you. Right? You want them to be able to solve their own problems on the field, in training, and that will help them outside of the camogie field as well. And so which side do you want your players to remember you by? All right, we've got two sides here, and it's why children play sport versus why children quit sport. Right? And um, this image was taken from Believe PHQ. Right? They've got many good images there, and there'll be a couple of them over the next slide. Right. So children want to have fun, they want to make friends, they want to improve skills, they want to challenge themselves. They want to take part in something they enjoy, they want to release stress, they want to get some exercise, they want to play in a team, they want to win, they want to be like their role models. So that's the kind of environment that you might want to tr try to create. Um, ticking every box at the start, not something that you need to do, right? but it, they will start following one another as you start noticing that that's the side you want to be with, right? You do not want players going forward thinking that um, they aren't respected or they don't get on with the coach or there's too much emphasis on winning, that they're no longer interested in the sport, maybe because they're afraid of making mistakes or they don't get enough playing time or it's been made too competitive and it's not fun anymore and they're under serious pressure to perform. 
And it's at that kind of a stage, at the start, right, it's, it's, no, it's no good to these players. And we'll start losing players because of it. 15 behaviours that characterise good coaching. All right. So focusing on the larger areas here, like praise, respect, support, fun, calmness, teamwork, positivity, trust, encouragement, enthusiasm, engagement, role model, organised, ambitious and collaborative. These are the areas that we're talking about that characterise good coaching. Okay, so we want to, going back through some of them there, we want to show respect to all. Right? We, uh, they're they're going to learn from this. So in terms of the opposition or the referees, showing respect. Right? And that in turn will teach your um, players to show respect and learn respect. To support each other, right? just helping each other and helping players to figure out ways to maybe overcome barriers. So setting up the stage there for them to, to go out and solve something. And if they're struggling with it, then there can be discussions had afterwards and maybe we can help support them in that. You know, fun is a big thing there again. You want to see a smile on their face. Right? They come into training smiling, they leave training smiling. Uh, calmness. Right? Under pressure, can you stay calm? If you can, then you're going to be passing that message on to your players as well. Uh, with the positivity, you want to build self-esteem. Right? Positivity to one player might be scoring a point. Positivity to another player might be catching the ball successfully and passing it off to a teammate. Positivity for another player might be rising the ball up and getting a clean strike down the field. Okay? So you've got to know your players in these circumstances and know what is it, what needs to be um, given as a positive remark to those players so that they can feel good and build self-esteem. Uh, trust, right, in the middle of it there, trust your players, help the tr players trust you, okay? trust your management team, okay? everybody, every one of you need to be on the same page going to the field, right, you need to understand each other and there needs to be no mixed messages, right, so that means that planning needs to take place, discussions need to take place, right, because you need every coach, every selector, every member involved so that everything can run successfully. Right. One coach can't constantly watch 15, 20, 25 players, whatever you've got in the field in front of you. That's why the eyes need to be there and we need to be constantly engaging with the players. Um, motivating the players. Right? As I said, they're becoming organised. Right? You are a role model to these players and you may have other role models come in to help you out at different stages. And so how you act and behave is going to um, be something that's taken on. As, as we say, in a lot of stages, in a lot of cases, um, it's like the big brother house. You're being watched uh, and you're going to be taken, everything, every, everything you do uh, is, is taken in and it's going to be used again. So resilience then is the next thing, right? Keep challenging your athletes in sessions. Let your athletes make mistakes. Developing an, an environment where athletes can take risks. Ask effective questions when coaching. Try not to provide all the answers for your athletes and provide scenarios in sessions where athletes must problem solve. Okay, so with that resilience that we're talking about there, we're going to look at, uh, in a, at later on in the presentation, we're going to look at some game-based situations that will challenge your athletes. It will let them make mistakes because they're inevitably going to make mistakes. Uh, mistakes are inevitable in life. They're going to happen. Um, they're going to take risks and they're going to try and problem solve. So that's what we're talking about when we're looking towards game-based uh, scenarios. So with planning and preparation then, uh, how everyone thinks it looks, uh, real direct, real straight, um, everything is planned to a T and it's going to run like this. Uh, whereas how it should look, in one sense, it's a big squiggly line. What that's suggesting is that there is chaos involved, eh? but it's organised chaos. Right, so some situations then with planning and session. Right? So when we're talking about planning, you need to be planning directly towards what your team need, what your players need. Okay? So there's no point making a plan this year going to a new team next year 
and continuing with the same plan. Right. So those plans is something that needs to be maybe recorded because as these players move from 12 to 14, 14 to 16, then plans can be looked back on and maybe say, well, the long-term focus for the team this year was this area of the game. Uh, how good is that now? Can we develop it further? Can we move it to something else? What areas of the game does your team need to focus on? Be specific. Uh, you can have a monthly focus then. For the month of uh, May, we're all back in the field. Uh, what is the one area of the game that we really want to focus on? We want to make sure that this is good with our team. Then we can have a session-by-session session focus and we can break it down every time we come to the field. Uh, okay, our overall focus is this. Our overall focus is tackling, striking and shooting, yeah, for example. Right? Within each session, then, what are we going to focus on? You can break it down. Uh, and the biggest thing of all at the end of it there, know your team. Adjust plans based on performances. Okay, If you go out in a game and you see that there's a specific area that another team was better than you at, uh, then we can come back to the field and we can have a focus on that built into what we're talking about and maybe work towards improving that area, which will overall improve the, the team development. So planning. Allow for organised chaos within your sessions. Okay? So there needs to be a stage there where you kind of just stand back and let them play. Right? It's unstructured, but it has a focus. Right? So where we say that you might be out there to let them play, we'll go through scenarios here in the game-based situations that I'm going to bring up soon. Right? And within it, you want to let them make mistakes. You might bring them back into their teams or their small groups or focus groups. They might discuss something. Uh, you might get feedback or you might ask questions from what you've seen. And then you're going to go out and let them repeat the same game. And you're going to see how they learn from some of the earlier mistakes. Uh, you can give advice. All right. But the biggest thing is if you can ask questions and see if they can figure out the answers or figure out areas that might have went wrong themselves, then you know that you're setting up a case that your players are going to develop well. And they're getting used to game-based scenarios. Yes, they're getting used to problem solving and they're then in turn making decisions themselves. Okay, so something that I use there is the Gaelic Development Coach Planner. Right? So this is just a template that I've taken off of their website and it's in terms of an individual training session plan. Okay? So you might at the top of it have a look at the key points from previous sessions. Right? Then you have session targets and the skills you're going to practice. So within this particular one they're looking at tackling blocking and shooting right and then they've broken up the session down along warm-up um, and the different areas that are being covered and then at the end you've kind of got a reflection thing or points that have happened right so you can have that not not as specific specific maybe as this if you don't need to but that's an idea and something that we like to use ourselves in terms of coming to a session so that we know that hey yeah, Above all, I'm trying to improve the tackling for this team today. Okay? I have a focus on trying to improve tackling. We're going to focus on that. It might be in a chaotic environment at stages, but we're going to make sure that we discuss it and we're going to learn from it. So looking at the basic skills then and how we're going to bring them on. Okay? So I've just listed seven basic skills here involved with Komogi. So striking, catching, controlling, hooking and blocking. The solo, rising, movement. Uh, so there's many more areas, and even within the areas we've mentioned here, uh, we can break those down even further. Right? You can look at the different types of striking, the different types of catching, um, the different types of movement. Uh, but if we can look at those areas and try to develop them overall, then we're going to have the basic skills, which, were, which are extremely important for the players. So with those basic skills, the one big thing that you need to ask with each of them is, can they do it under pressure in a game? Okay? So inevitably, with games come a little bit of pressure. right? That could be just simply pressure from your opponent, the opposition. Right? They're going to put pressure on you because they want the ball that you're going for. Right? So we need to test them in training to see if they can control the ball under pressure, right? If they can't, 
then we can maybe pull back away. We, we will have seen that in a game situation. Then we can maybe pull back away from the game situation and we can test those skills to see if the technique is proper. Um, we could test it to see if they're comfortable doing it on their own, if they can get faster doing it, and then we can maybe bring them back into the game and see if we've improved it again. Okay? Um, game-based coaching. So what we're looking at with game-based coaching is we're looking to replicate the demands of the game in smaller scenarios. Each game for you as a coach should have a focus. Now, an example that I've just listed here is turning over the opposition or tackling. Now, that could be your focus as a coach for uh, a specific group each time in this session. Right? The, but the big thing to note, and is what other coaches will help you with during the session here as well, is that players will learn other areas of the game from this, such as evading the tackle, supporting their teammates to try and get them out of trouble if they have been maybe bottled up. Um, so inevitably, they're going to make many decisions in a game-based situation like so. Right, so you might play small-sided games, and an example that I've got listed here as well. Right, you might play a small-sided game that gets the two teams of maybe, say, four, five, six aside, uh, and help the. Uh, you might just say all goals in this. So you might help the players create goal chances, help players defend their own goals. So in this, this could be an area where you're going to let them play. You're going to stand back and you're going to watch their movements. You're going to look and see, do they crowd the area in front of goals? If the attacking team are always constantly getting in in front of the goals, then they're bottling up the area where they're going to have maybe a clean strike to score a goal. And then you can look at the defenders as well, and you can see if they're communicating well. Right? Some of the biggest things and the biggest challenge for players, and especially girls on the field, is actually talking to each other and passing on messages. Right? And it's something that needs to be developed well from an, uh, an early age. And see if they're cutting out the space. And the second uh, point that I've got here is in relation to these small-sided games or even other um, larger-sided games, individual players can be given guidelines to follow for the game. Right? So you might speak to an individual player before the game starts and you might give them uh, something to follow. So an example that I've written down here is you have one forward that always shoots if it's the right or wrong decision. And so this forward has been taught that they're the scoring forward. They're going to shoot. They have the best opportunity to shoot, right? But for this game, in this game-based situation, uh, they're based on how many scores they set up in the game. So this is helping them to bring in other players. You know, you're, you're looking at how you can improve situations within the game or within your team from what you may have noticed from a previous game. And so game-based coaching, let it run. See them make decisions. You might take notes from this. You might have focus groups to discuss what they learned, right? Or it could be if you have a 4v4, then four, um, one set of four and the other set of four will go and discuss how their game has went. And there might be a coach just maybe listening on the outside or getting involved by asking questions to them groups. See how can they improve what they're doing? Ask them questions, right? And let them get back at it again. Okay, so what I've got now over the next couple of uh, a good number of slides here is different ideas that we can bring to the field to work on maybe basic skills or different areas of the game um, from warm-up through the whole way. Uh, so it's just ideas that we can use in the field. So the first one that I've got here is a tag game, and it's a warm-up. right? So looking at the box on the left there, we've got six yellow, we've got two blue, and we've got one ball involved. Right, it doesn't necessarily have to start this way. It could start with uh, four yellow with one ball and one blue. Okay, And basically, the blue's job here is to chase and tag a yellow player. If they do, the yellow player becomes a blue player and the blue player becomes a yellow player. Right? The idea of the ball in this game is that the yellow team have a ball. And if somebody is almost in trouble of getting tagged by a blue player. Then a yellow player with possession of the ball can get the ball to the player that is in trouble, their hand, right? get the ball to their hand, and once they're in possession of the ball, they can't get tagged. Right? So you're bringing in an element of the game here where they're looking up, they're getting their heads up, and they're um, scanning the area to see 
how can I get someone out of trouble or how can I get away from a tackle, right? So you can vary the numbers in that. You can increase the balls to two or you can change it up in terms of the amount of tigers. Um, and it's an excellent, it's an excellent warm-up situation that will ensure that the players are moving different directions and they're getting in a lot of um, different uh, speed changes, evading the tackle. It's, it's an excellent thing to build up the heart rate at the start of the session. So circle variations is another one that we use early on. We can include it for a warm-up. Um, so with this one here, you've got eight players on the outside and you've got eight players in the middle. So you have, an, you have eight players on the outside, one at each blue cone, and eight players spread out among the middle. So each player on the outside here might have a ball to start with, right? And basically, they're going to spend 30 to 40 seconds working in the middle, and then they change. So they're changing relatively quick. So you could do 30 seconds striking the ball to the player's hand in the middle. The person in the middle receives the ball, gives it back to them on the outside, changes direction, and go again. Make sure that they're not going, if they've, say, for example, received the ball off of number seven here, who's on the 21, they can't go to number six or number eight next. They need to go back to maybe one or four or three. You can't go to the person beside where you've just been. So you're constantly changing direction. Then you can, you're, you're going to change them every 30 seconds. You can walk on the low ball in where they're going to control and hand pass it out. Right? Um, or you can even increase the, the tempo of it then and they have to receive the ball and they have to sprint out around the player that they've gotten the ball off of. Give it back to them and go again. Um, the ball might start in the middle and the player in the middle is going to pick someone on the outside. They're going to strike the ball to them. The player on the outside is just going to bat the ball back down onto the ground and that player is going to react to the breaking ball that's just dropped on the ground, get it to their hand as quickly as possible and go again. Yeah. You can also add in a lot of areas here where you're going to include your fundamental movements. So you can have everyone within the square and you can have balls scattered along the ground, right? And you're going to be rising and dropping or hand passing and or rolling and flicking the ball to each other. Um, and then you're going to maybe change and get in areas of the lunging, for example. Um, or you could have um, striking going on along the outside and you could have a tag game going on in the middle here. Uh, or you could have... 6v6 in the middle and 2v2 on the outside. Okay, so the 6v6 start with the ball in the middle and they're going to use possession of the ball and they have to pass the ball to, the, to one of their teammates on the outside and that gets them a score. Okay, or you could extend the circle and you could have your area in front of the goal and they have to get three passes and when they get three passes, they have a shot at the main goal. Okay, so these are just ideas. There's lots of different variations you can build into that. And you can get an awful lot done by just um, working in an area like that. Um, there's loads of different variations that you can do. Okay, so possession games then. Right, so bottom left corner here, we've got an even numbers possession game. We've got 4v4. Right, so we're talking about the basic skills here. Right? You can change the size, change the numbers. Um, so for this game, we're working on the hand pass. Right? So it's hand passing. Uh, for the next game, we might be working on the low strike and you're dealing with uh, controlling the ball under pressure in a small space. So we're going to strike the ball along the ground. Can I control it, get it to my hand and move before I get tackled? Um, if you have players that are finding this relatively easy, then you can go to an uneven number possession game. So you could go to 4v2. Uh, um you could also do a rough ball game within those situations. So you could have uh, the ball drop between a 1v1 and they're going to fight for the ball on the ground. When they get the ball up, have their teammates got into a position to so that they can pass the ball off? Or have you had ended up with a 4v4 at the rook? And as I call that, or as we call it a lot of the time, um, we've got rook inspectors. Okay, So we've got players stuck in Right, my eyes on the ball, my eyes on the ball, but it's not going to help them because they need to be watching what's happening outside the ruck as well because one of their players may have just evaded them and got in for a goal if the opposition catch, uh, got the ball won in the ruck. Okay, so you need to just make sure that you have that addressed across. Then uh, between the 45 and 65 there, we've got two squares. So we've got 3v3 in each square 
and you've got both squares working together across. So you could say two passes and you have to clear the ball aimlessly in one sense to the other square. And then they've got to deal with the ball, dropping at them under pressure, win possession, two passes, strike it back to the other side again. And we can develop that on further to make sure that the passes are going to your teammates as I'll show that at a later stage here. So as I said earlier, a non-negotiable that I always have is um, working hard, all right? Making sure that you work really hard for the team, working really hard for each other. So this is something that I use uh, to try and develop that. So taking the left-hand side of the screen there, we've got four yellows, B2 in a square, and you've got two blue uh, on their own in the square above it. So it's called, it's basically a 4B2 plus two. So the yellow players here have got to keep the ball in that square in a 4v2 uh, on the ground, in their hand, hand passing, just making sure that they keep possession so they're making the, a decision on how to keep possession each time. The two blue players have to work really hard. They have to talk to each other and they've got to try and win that ball back off the yellow players. The second they win the ball back, they bring it up to their two blue two, two teammates in the, in the square above, and then it becomes four blue and two yellow from the bottom square go up and try and win the ball back. So you'll end up having a 4v2 above. Now, it's a really, really good exercise. It's a really tiring exercise. Uh, so you would do it for a short period of time. You break, water, discuss, and you might do it again. Uh, um, in terms of support, heads up decision-making game, uh, I would have used this as well at the Easter development camp that happened last year with Tip Komogi. It was an excellent week's work, uh, very well organised and some great coaching went on. The players seemed to really enjoy it in there. Um, and it's just a gates game, as I call it. So you've got here, in this instance, you've got five sets of gates spread out between the 45 and the 21. And you've got um, the 8 for 8 example here. Um, the blue team in possession of the ball, they get a score by running through a gate, right? Once they've run through one gate, they have to go through another gate in the area before they can repeat, go through that same gate again. So you can't go through the same gate two, for two scores in a row. Uh, you, might that, you might start this off with a 4v4 and just two gates, or a 5v5 and three gates. You might go, go to a smaller area. You can vary this up depending on what you need. But the basic idea here is that they will carry the ball, they'll break tackles, they'll support each other. Um, they might get the head up and even see that somebody has got into a good position 20 yards away and they'll get a strike pass to them, catch the ball and they'll have gathered a score. Okay, so it's an excellent game for decision making that way. Um, so earlier we spoke about the 3v3 on each side and just a clear delivery straight across the other square. So with this one, we've got the delivery game. So this is a development on it. So is what, I've called, is what I have there in the center is a free delivery zone. So you've got 4v4 on each side. And say so the blue team have possession in the right square. They, at the start, might have to make two passes and get the ball struck to a blue teammate at the far side. If they get into the zone in the middle, it's called a free delivery zone. They can't be ca uh, tackled and they get a free strike to one of their blue teammates on the opposite side. Um, you might develop that on, and you, know, you have the constant question, how many passes do I need? Um, just to get people involved and get them making decisions and helping them support each other, you can include passes. But once you've seen that this has become good, uh, you might take the passes, the number of passes out of it. Because within a game, you don't have to have a set number of passes to clear a ball. You just have to try to make the right decision to deliver the right ball. So you can take the number of passes out of it as you've developed and as players have become comfortable um, supporting each other. So that's an area that is excellent as well. And it's something that you can use to maybe help your team maybe carry the ball so far out of defence so that they would be able to strike a ball further down the field into the forward line. Okay, so you can start this off smaller and as you get on through 16s and 18s, you develop it even further. Uh, another game here is 
calls the overload game. So in this instance, you've got six v four inside in the square in front of the goal, right? So the six blue players have a ball in their hand and they might try to uh, keep possession by hand passing the ball uh, around within that zone. You've got four uh, opponents inside and the four opponents are going to work really hard to turn over possession. And is what you want to instill then after a development on from that. When you've turned over possession in the opponent's half, can you score? Right. So I've turned over possession. Can we make sure that we've uh, turned over possession and got a score? So you now have uh, a stage developed where you're turning over the opponents and you're punishing them even further by getting a score. And you have a coach there on the outside ready to throw in another ball to the team, the larger team in possession, and they'll again work on keeping the ball. So they're trying to keep the ball, they're supporting each other, they're making a number of decisions in the game. Uh, you stop it, assess it, and go back and play it again, maybe. Hand passing and support, mini games. Uh, so here you've got, say, 3v3 in a square within the blue cones, and then you've got goals as the red poles. So basically, the blue team are working towards the end line. Their job is to try and carry the ball through the red gates, and for game one, they might just drop the ball there, step back, and be ready to defend the red and black team who are going to attack the goals on the 45. Then you might have three balls at each goal. So you might have three balls on the 45, you might have three balls on the 21. And the job is for the blue team or the red and black team to get all six balls to the end that they're scoring. So if the blue team have got a score on the 21, they go back and get another ball from their side. right? So this means the red and black team have to turn them over, they have to tackle effectively, uh, to make sure they get possession back. Then you could develop that on further to have a full wick game, and you could have all players in that area playing from sideline to sideline. You could have three balls on each sideline, and they have to work the ball from one sideline to the other. Um, or you could have a breaking, so you could have, say, 4v4 in the first square on the left-hand side, and they have to make two passes, and once they've made two passes, they break into the middle zone. Uh, so we've got three squares in this instance here. We've got a square on the left, we've got a square in the middle, and we've got a square on the right. Uh, and say the blue team are in possession, once they get to the middle zone, uh, all players are then in the middle zone, and the blue players have to make two more passes before they get into the final zone on the right, and for them, they have to make two passes and get over the line. Uh, so they're going to work together, um, and then they're going to break forward together. Uh, end zone game in the middle area there you've got a 5v5 for example and their job is to um, so the blue team are working from left to right their, go their job is to get a clean strike from a blue player in the middle zone to the hand of a blue player on the, on the end right you can start this off smaller as well yeah, so you could have maybe a 1v1 at either end, so you could work from maybe the 14 to the 45, and you could have a 1v1 at either end with 3v3 in the middle, and it just gets them thinking about striking the ball into the inside forward line, right? So I want to get the ball struck into the inside forward line, but there's two aspects of it, and a lot of people will notice that inside forwards, they may not necessarily know how to move in terms of getting in the right position to receive a ball that will help them when they get the ball. So this is the game that we can use to um, develop movement of the inside forward and maybe getting themselves in a, posi in a position to try and receive a pass from the middle zone. Um, you can have it on the top left there, you've got a, a three-way end zone game. So you've actually got three teams. And so the yellow team have to try and score in either the blue or the red. And you have to defend, defend your own area. You could also have a case here where the yellow team are trying to keep possession and your blue and red team work together to turn them over. Uh, or you could have um, two goalies from sideline to sideline broken up into three zones. Uh, so the job here is that the goalie has to pick a ball, 
the, the goalie has to put the ball to uh, the first zone and the team gets three points if they turn them over in the first zone. The opponent opposition team gets two points if they turn them over in zone two or they get one point if they turn them over in zone three. So it's about a little bit of a, a kind of a press and making sure the opposition don't build up momentum and you try and turn them over in the opponent's half. A support play game. I, um, so this instance here, you've got the blue team in possession. So you've got a uh, 6v6 and then you've got four players in the four squares. So one near either sideline, one in front of the goals and one out around the middle of the field. Yeah, this is if you've got larger numbers. So the job here is for a blue player to strike the ball to any one of the squares. Right? And once you've struck a ball, so I'm after I'm a blue player, I strike the ball to the square just above where support play game is um, written on the screen. Right? And one of my blue teammates must run and support that player. Yeah? So you get a score by one player striking the ball to the square and another player coming and receiving the ball off of the player in the zone. Yeah, so that's a support play. It gets the idea going where players work together. Okay, I'm delivering a ball in from midfield. The ball is inside in the inside forward line and I might have a wing forward running on to take the pass off the inside forward. And that's an opportunity to break the line and maybe get a score. You could start this off smaller as well and you could just have two zones and it's working from, say, six-yard box out to just outside the 45. And again, you're working on, for this instance, the blue team strike the ball to the player in the six-yard box or just outside the six-yard box. And to get a score, somebody has to run on, get a pass off them and strike a goal or a point. Or strike it to the player outside the 45 and run on, get a support pass and strike it down the field as a clearance. Uh, coaches will have another ball ready to go. Breaking ball game, uh, you could have... So looking at A here, you have a ball dropping down on a 1v1. And from there, um, those compete for the ball. And then it becomes a 3v3. So you've got a player coming from the 45 at either side coming in to try and win the break. Uh, if this has... Um, may be proven difficult or we weren't getting success from it, you could go to a variation to three off the tree. So you could have, say, two yellow and one blue on one 45 and two blue and one yellow on the opposite 45. Uh, so where you have the two blue and one yellow, a blue and a yellow will compete under the ball for um, on the 45 and the other blue will be positioned about five or ten yards in front of it and once the ball goes over their head, they're responding and reacting back to try to win the ball that has broken. Uh, and then they pass it to their teammate, maybe, or you'll strike it back to the opposite side again. Uh, you can also vary on this game even further. If that has developed well for you and we're getting used to winning the breaks, uh, you could develop it onto one, once you win the breaks that you have to get yourself in a position to give a good delivery into the inside line, maybe. Or you have to hit a zone. You could set up a zone inside just just inside the 21. And whichever team wins the ball has to try and get themselves in a position to strike the ball into that zone. Um, individual battles here. So there's three different situations set up in this field. Right, so we're going to look at the left of the screen first. Right? And you've got a blue square between the 21 and the 45. You've got a, two blue cones in the middle, and you've got two, a blue square on the opposite sideline as well. So we're working from sideline to sideline in this game, uh, and we're focusing on the blue cones. So the ball starts here on the sideline with the, the blue player. That blue player is going to strike the ball low along the ground. The red and blue player in the middle are going to come, and they're going to fight for the ball. They're going to battle. They're going to have an individual battle. One of them is going to win it. Whoever wins it has to carry it through the blue gate, once they carry it through the blue gate, they hit a high ball up into the area for the blue player and the red player on the opposite side to fight for it in the air. One of them will win the ball 
be it cleanly in the air or from a breaking ball. If they've won the ball outside the zone, they have to get back into the zone. If they've won the ball in the zone, they have to get outside the zone. And once they do one of those, they hit a low ball back along the ground in the middle again. And they fight for it, get through the zone and the same back. So you're working over and back the field. It's an extremely tiring one. And after maybe 45 to 60 seconds, you'll stop, small break, and the middle players change. Right? That has also an opportunity to develop onto a longer strike and drill there where you've got the red poles positioned on the 21 centre of the field and the 21. So you do the very same thing, uh, except you've got longer striking. And as what you can also add in here is that whoever wins it at either end has to run through the gates and maybe get a score. And then they pick up another ball and start it again. Uh, and the bottom right-hand game here is we've got an outside support player game. Yeah, so you've got a 4v4 within the square and 2v2 outside. So the players on the outside have to keep moving around the outside. So if the blue team have possession of the ball, the blue players on the outside have to try and get in a position to receive a pass from their teammates inside the zone. When they receive a pass on the outside, they go into the zone and then the player that gave them the pass goes to the outside. Right? So it gets players trying to help their teammates. Um, three goal games. It's an excellent game for goalie. All right, so you can see there the three poles. Um, and number six is in the middle of them. So number six is your goalie. Blue team are in possession or red team are in possession. And the job for them is to uh, work a ball and take a shot on a goalie. So the goalie has to position themselves in the goal that they feel most that the goal that, is, that the goal may be scored in. Um, so they're constantly going to maybe moving from one zone to the other. And the team that are not in possession have to try and carry the ball out to one of the four circles that I have labelled there. And once they carry it out to them in zones, they then become the attackers. Or you could take the centre of it out, centre goalie out of it there, and you could have a four corners game where you have the red team working towards two corners and the blue team working towards the opposite two corners. Um, and the other game then I have around the goals game. So you've a goal positioned in the centre there. So juvenile goals, for example, and you're going to work on. Um, the, the red team have the ball and they get a score by striking over the goals and you can increase that even further then if you wanted you could give extra points if the red team struck it over the goals and they actually struck it to one of their teammates on the opposite side now, that's as you develop on to the older ages uh, and the final one that I've got here for this is the backs and forwards game right? so your ball's positioned there with your goalie your ball's positioned um, which is actually cut off there at the centre of the field. And you've also got balls positioned on the, say, the 14 and the 45 on either sideline. And so the idea here is that we're changing where the ball has been delivered or used from each time. So you might say that the goalie has to hit a ball out to their backs and they have to work it out the field. Or you might say that the midfielder has to pick a ball at midfield and run forward or deliver a ball into their inside line. Or you could have a sideline uh, going out from the number two corner back and how are we positioning? How are we setting up? Can we work it out? Or you could have a forward uh, with a sideline cut coming in from outside the 45. Again, how are we setting up defensively? Uh, how are we going to move to try and win the ball as a forward and get a score? So it's just a different variation rather than just standing in the middle of the field, striking the ball in and backs and forwards because it becomes monotonous and um, it just gets players thinking more and more. It, it puts it back, it puts the game back in their hands a little bit more. So the last area that we're going to look at tonight is gameplays for team development. So what are gameplays? Gameplays are examples of scenarios the players may face in a competitive game. We practice these in training to help the players develop a team-based solution to solving possible problems. Uh, so how would you like your team to look when you're defending an attack? How would you like your team to go about attacking or creating a score? Uh, so now we're going to a stage where we're at under 16, we're at under 18. We've worked on this the smaller game base at under 14. And they have an idea of uh, how to play the game. They're making good decisions. Uh, now can we do these gameplays that will help us become better on the field um, and develop even further? So I've got some examples here that I would have used over time. So what we've got here is the red team uh, have a puck out. And as you can see, the blue team have stepped off their players. So the inside full forward line have come out between the 21 and the 14, or the 21 and the 45. 
the half forwards have dropped back, the midfielder has dropped back. And this is in the case that if a team have a long puck out, right, you've got a situation where you've got more players back out the field, right? And in, in an unlikely circumstance at these age groups, you'd have a situation where the goalie might actually just poke the ball to a full back or a cornerback. You need to be setting you need to be preparing them that they will move forward accordingly. Uh, that they will move forward accordingly and put pressure. Right? A goalie with, with an um unchallenged strike will have a decent strike. A cornerback under pressure, right, you have more of a chance of uh, winning the ball back. So this is what you could do to maybe tease out an opposition if they weren't able to win the ball working out the field, they might try this. Okay, you've now an opportunity to turn them over in zone one, as we would have talked about in an earlier game. Uh, this is the situation if they puck the ball out long and they have a long puck out. Okay, we've now got a ball dropping right back out the field and you've got an you've got a num numerical advantage to your team um, based on where we had originally set ourselves up and positioned ourselves. Okay, um, so from this one here, uh, if we are defending an attack, right? We're defending an attack, so they've got the ball in the back line, all right? So let's say, for example, the, the number five, we know that number five is going to have a clean strike because they've won the ball there. Um, so maybe at under 18 here, you're developing them into thinking that uh, they're going to strike the ball long into the inside forward line if they can. The number six gets themselves in a position to drop back and help the um, help the full back line cut out the ball that's going to be delivered. All right, just go back to there. And I'll just let it play through. So you've got the number six ready to maybe anchor the back line and cut out the ball that's been delivered to maybe uh, one of the better players that they're trying to aim for at number 14. Uh, in doing so, the number six has to communicate to get the midfielder back the midfielder has to communicate to get the number 10 back. Right? It's something that would take a lot of work, right? but it is beneficial to a team because it helps um, squeeze out the areas that might potentially cause a goal to be scored against you. Right? You might start that out by simply getting a wing forward to go out and help, help at midfield. And then you might develop that on to getting the midfielder to help out at the half-back line. And that might in turn then help with a uh, centre-back who in a lot of positions, in a lot of set setups, is your uh, is one of your better players, they're going to then maybe set themselves up to get back and defend it. Now, something I like to do, and I've done it with uh, juvenile teams before, um, and I've seen it, and I actually developed it through um, Colin Nally. Um, he's done excellent stuff there uh, over time, and something that he would have developed, or not developed, but used, with teams at underage that got them making decisions on the field themselves. So the blue team are in attack here. They've just had an attack on goal. They might have scored, it might have been wide, and then automatically we have a rotation in the forward line where they move clockwise by one position. Now, one thing that we need to develop our players to be able to do is to play in numerous positions. Now, gone are the days of, I'm a corner forward, and I'm only a corner forward. I'm a centre forward, I'm only a centre forward. I'm a wing back and only a wing back. All right. We need to be creating the situations where our players are able to play in a number of different positions. Okay. And in doing something like this, they have um, onus on the field to make that move. They've got to make the call to do so. And it will help them uh, become more communicative, uh, have more communication on the field. Um, and it might. Uh, unsettle the opposition as well who might not be used to it. Um, situation here, right? So 4 and 7 and 10 and 13 are down for a, a rook, right? The ball is on the ground. Uh, number 4 is winning this ball. We just look at number 3 gets themselves in a position behind so that we can pop the ball back to them. They haven't got involved in the rook, but they've got themselves in a position to help the player when they win the rook. And also, if the opposition had won the ball, we weren't and gone out of there. Right? That number three then has number eight uh, back from midfield that they can carry the ball out to pop with them and they break forward. Uh, 
you can practice this. This is a gameplay scenario. You can practice this within training. Uh, uh, puck out. You want to puck the ball out to your centre forward, right? Or a midfielder, for example, right? What I've got set up here is a situation where the midfielders will help you as a goalkeeper puck the ball into space for your number 11, right? That's just an example of a gameplay scenario that you would practice. It doesn't have to be from a goalie to a centre forward. It can be to a goalie, from a goalie to a midfielder, to a wing forward, to a centre back, right? It's whatever suits the team that you're dealing with. Yeah, so that brings us back to this slide again. Yeah, so when we talk about everything we've spoken about tonight, what are your core values? How will you approach your coaching role? What is your purpose and style? How will you approach player development? Define the term success to you. I hope from what we've discussed tonight that you might have taken ideas for all of those areas, like the core values. You want a good attitude with your team. You want them to learn. You want them to be able to develop with different things that you might uh, now take to your coaching sessions based on what we've discussed or maybe some of the advice that I've offered tonight. Right? These are things that I have found that work with some teams for me. They haven't worked with other teams. Right? You have to find what works for your team. Right? Some of the books that I went through recently, Conscious Coaching, uh, Win, Proven Strategies for Success in Sport, Life and Mental Health. And then the Carver Coaching Framework, Paul Kilgannon, Be the Best You Can Be in Sport and Coaching Children in Sport. Those are two excellent books and I would highly recommend them. Um, for many of us who are following Twitter uh, or different areas, some of the areas that I follow, uh, I gather an awful lot of information from these. Uh, some of them then that I might take and I might just tweet them to, to support what I need for a coaching session or the team that I'm based with. Um, so there's a list of a lot of different people, including the, our um, people involved here with us tonight, like Barry and Brian. Um, they've got some excellent stuff on Twitter and um, through Daily Sport as well. Um, I'd highly recommend uh, taking a look in and just uh, following different people and learning from them. Yeah. We're all in it to support each other, so it's all about learning. Uh, and uh, I just want to finish up by saying thanks to all for joining. I hope you gain something. Uh, I will be making this presentation available. Um, and if you have any further questions, even after tonight, feel free to send me a direct message and I will try my best to offer some advice. Um, so, look, I hope you gained uh, something from it and um, I'm sure you'll have some questions that the three of us might be able to tackle together there now. Thanks very much, Denny. That was excellent. Um, I'll hand over to you there, lads. Brian, Barry, any yeah. questions coming in? Brilliant, brilliant Denny. Absolutely laden with content there. Fair, fair play. Two quick questions. I think you answered one there. One was about the uh, availability of the pr presentation. And the other one that I have there is uh, from Bobby. Would the circle variations that you use with the, the playing in and out game, would that be suitable for a pre-match warm-up? Uh, definitely, yeah. Um, it would be. Uh, you can do a lot of different variations within it. Um, and it is something that we have used even with the Camogie setup. Even last year, we would have used it before the quarterfinal against Limerick, uh, the year previous, sorry, um, inside the Tempest Stadium. Uh, we would have used it at that level. I would have used it as uh, under 14 coaching in my local club. Um, it gets them moving in different angles. It's excellent like that. It's getting them a larger number of um, opportunities to touch the ball and maybe shake off some of those nerves that they have before games. Um, I think it's, a, it's definitely an excellent uh, thing that you could use in the pre-match form. Yeah, brilliant. Denny, there was a question in from, uh, from Bobby there. Um, it was an early, one of your earlier um, games-based slides, uh, the tactical pad slides. Would, a, would the circle variations be suited? Oh, yeah, same question. Sorry, you just answered that, Brian. No matters. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's Any other questions in at the minute, lads? No? no? Nothing yet there at the moment, I don't think. Uh, so a question in from Niall. Um, the position of goalkeeper all seems to be a problem, especially as girls... Uh, 
as girls get older. Any suggestions on how to fill the position, being conscious that a girl may have to play it, but might not be her favourite position? Um, yeah, look, I suppose it is one of the big things, and an awful lot of clubs have the same problem. We can't get a goalkeeper. Um, personally, I think a goalkeeper should have, should be and will be over time be one of your um, skillful players. They will be very well developed. Uh, they'll have good striking. They'll be comfortable and confident on ball. And that's something that you develop. And it takes time. They're going to get individual coaching. But I suppose from the earlier stages uh, and the earlier ages, like in any of those games where you have a goalkeeper involved, um, unless you have a situation where you have an out-and-out goalkeeper, then it's a case of game one, you've got one goalkeeper. Game two, you've got another goalkeeper. Right, so you put people into these situations that um, they might not necessarily be overly comfortable in at the start, but you're going to learn from their experience there, and they're going to learn from their experience there, whether it's something that they might be able to develop upon further. And as a coach watching it, you might see um, you might see something that you might like to work on further. And I know as I get on the age groups and we do it, um, we do it an awful lot with Tip or even myself as a goalkeeper with the team. Uh, it's about uh, having players and making sure that they're getting goalkeeping coaching, right? Because they, they need, a, a goalkeeper does not need to be in the middle of some of those game-based situations. There could be a different setup situation uh, or one in the field with a specific coach and they can be working that goalkeeper. Right, their specifics are different to um, the specifics in the field. Um, that's just some of my thoughts on that there, lads, if you have anything that you need to, want, like to add into that. Spot on, Danny. Any, is there, is that all the questions? Um... Lads, that's I think that's in, that's in there at the moment, yeah. Yeah, lovely. Um, I suppose if there is no more questions, and I know we've gone a bit over time, um, I think uh, I just want to thank the three of you for the last three weeks on behalf of Tipperary Development. Um, Camogie, we're delighted. Um, and we're delighted to all the attendees. We've had large attendance for the three nights. So thank you very much to all the clubs for supporting it. Um, we are going to run one more um, over the next couple of weeks. And it was one, it's a goalkeeping one, hopefully. Um, it's, 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 Dini has just been touching on it there. But um, from the questionnaire that we sent out, that came through very strong. So we, we will try and organise that for everybody. Um, so everybody that joined the webinars over the last three weeks will get a feedback form tomorrow. So if you could maybe find the time to fill that in. We'd be absolutely delighted and we'll take all your feedback on board um, for, for future webinars and future coaching sessions. So I suppose that that's it. And just thanks again to the lads. Thanks very much for giving the time. We're delighted to have you. Thanks a million. All right. So good night, everybody. And thanks very much. Two quick Grania. questions in there. Grania, is it, is oh. it too late to call them? No. Okay. Never too late. Um, just one from Frankie. Most condition games involve pressure, but young kids need to perfect skills in unpressurized situations. Would you agree? First, um, yeah. Look, you're you're going to do a lot of those unpressurized situations um, from the earlier age groups. Anyway, you're going to do them from under 10, 12, 14, and you're hoping by the stage that you get to fourteen, sixteen, that you have. Uh, within your club done enough development that you're you're going to be able to add that little bit of pressure right and for me I always believe at those age groups that if you can uh, have them competing with one another you're going to learn how well they are um, with those skills and if you can see areas that need to be improved then you can pull back from those skills or, or from those games and maybe work on trying to improve them um, individualized or in a 1v1 situation um, and you, you, you'll be able to maybe work on ensuring that you have the unpressurized situations and the pressurized situations developed well. Good, yeah. 
think that's it. The other one is just a comment from Pat saying thanks very much for his time and and uh, and great uh, webinars and the same from James there. I think. Okay, lovely. Yeah. Okay, so lads, thanks again, and we we'll leave it there so for tonight. Thanks a million. Take care. Thanks everybody. Thank, Thank you. you.